Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Well, amen. As I looked out over the crowd, I saw Andy. Andy Hickman right over here. A hundred days in the hospital and came out alive. That's the, that's the other end of it. So. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning, Jeremiah's strange conduct. And we see some unusual conduct in Jeremiah's life as he's standing before the people doing and having done some strange things. Now the good news is that God had told him to do it. <laughs> some of us do some strange things and God didn't have anything to do with it. But we've seen both the active sermons of both Jeremiah and Ezekiel. In Isaiah, he gave two of his sons odd names. Now, I'm always amazed about that. We don't have just down-to-earth names anymore. I mean, I'm not going to say it, but we've, we've got some strange names out there. But how about... Meher Shalabaz Hajbaz. <laughs> Boy, don't you know that drives the teachers crazy. It means swift are the spoils, speedy is the plunder. Or sheer Jazbub. That's a nice name. And when the boys complained about it, Dad said, God told me to name you that. Isaiah 20, God told Isaiah to walk barefooted and buck naked through town. I thought about that, and if God told me to draw attention to the gospel, I hope I'd be obedient. But I believe I'd ask God to let Rusty do it and really draw some attention. <laughs> but if you see me acting strangely, it may be God is sending a message. Or it may not. Maybe it's just because I'm strange. But <laughs> nevertheless, God did with them, spoke to them, and spoke to that Wasn't that funny? Uh, anyway, Jeremiah had some things that he was prohibited from doing. And these first nine verses, God forbid Jeremiah from participating in three normal and acceptable activities. That was getting married, mourning for the dead, and attending feasts. Forbidden. And I learned this fact while I was studying this week. Jewish men were expected to be married by the age of 20. In fact, the rabbis pronounced a curse on any who refused to marry and have children. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled. How many men here were married at age 20? There you, there you go. Don't be ashamed. I guess I'm Jewish uh, there. How many had a child at 21? A couple of y'all. How about 20? 
All right. Keith and I are so close in age, I told him he could call me Bud. He didn't even have to call me Pop. <laughs> but don't you know Jeremiah would have appreciated having a wife to support him and to love him with all that he was going through? You know, the scripture says, He that findeth a good wife hath a good thing. That's a bad side of town. <laughs> but I had a friend that called his wife Good Thing. I don't know if he couldn't remember her name or what, but he called her Good Thing. But he was better off as a single man, but for Jeremiah it was a, a, a symbolic act. If anybody asked him why he wasn't married, he had opportunity to share God's message about the up upcoming judgment. Why aren't you married? God has judgment coming upon our land. And then the Jewish people in biblical times were experts at mourning. I've always said I'm going to hire some mourners for my services. If there's not, I'm going to hire some, really. Last resort, I'm going to let my kids and Joan sing special music, and they'll all cry. I know. It. We don't sing that good. Maybe some light wailing, but nothing heavy. But seriously, Jeremiah was forbidden to even go to a funeral or to a wedding, or a feast. What would he say when somebody talked about his unsociable behavior? How could he justify it? Well, he would say that God's judgment was coming. And we need to bring that home. We need to have a reality check, if you will. I think of Matthew 24, it says, But as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, we read the Word of God, and all we need to do is look around. Are you ready for the Lord's return? Are your loved ones, do we live like it? Or do we just move along in a pleasure-mad society and concern more about feasting than we are fasting? Loving the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, more than the things of God. You know, Paul wrote, and he said, Demoth has forsaken us, having loved this present world. Didn't say he didn't love the Lord. It says that he loved the world more than he did the Lord. And we've got to ask ourselves where we fit in in that question. The world or the Lord? Well, a local restaurant came out with a new item on their menu. I'd like to share it with you, but if I share it with you, y'all will all eat there, and then they'll be out when I get there. And so just trust me. But they came out with a new item called buttermilk shrimp. And it is the absolute best shrimp that I've ever had in my life. I mean, it's not fried flat. It's plump. And don't anybody get up and leave. But it, it is something. And, and I tell you, I don't know how many people I've told about it. I'm, I'm excited about it. And then I thought, how many folks have I told that Jesus is coming again? 
And am I as excited about that as I am about the new shrimp dish? Letting people know, caring enough about it to tell them that Jesus is coming again. Maranatha, our Lord cometh. And then I got to thinking about that and I got over in the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is speaking and he said, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his, as his work shall be. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and go in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, Jeremiah had an explanation 10 through 13 and 16 through 18. It's strange that the people would wonder why all of this came upon them. They had the word of God. Oh, they didn't read it. I know how my, fin my sin affects God. You know, as a lost person, Nobody needed to tell me I was lost. The Holy Spirit of God did that all by himself. But the scripture told me, and I knew it. Even as a believer, God shows me my sin. There's a picture in John 13 where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And he gets to Peter, and Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. I have need to wash your feet. And the Lord tells Peter, he said, if I don't wash your feet, I'll not have anything to do with you. And Peter then, I love Peter, okay, Lord, then just wash me all over. <laughs> I mean, he was impulsive. He was ready. And Jesus said, you're clean all over, but you need your feet washed. You know, the people then understood it better than we do because they went down to the public baths and they got all shampooed up and soaked up and rinsed off and foo-foo put all over them. And, and then they headed back home and they walked through the dusty streets of Jerusalem. And we got to their home or they got to the home of the people that they were visiting they brought out a, a basin of water and <clears throat> they washed their feet because the rest of them was clean. The rest of them had been cleansed, but they'd picked up dust and dirt on the way home and they needed their feet washed. You know, that's us. Even if we're saved and we've been washed in the blood of Christ, we walk through this world and we pick up all kind of dirt. And we need to have that spiritual foot washing. First John 1 John 1.9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, these were led astray by false prophets and they were comfortable in their sins. And they couldn't understand why God would hold them accountable. Now, let me say this about that while we're here. Regardless of what church that you go to, you better carry you in a Bible. And I've even got some young people convincing me that they have it on cell phone, you know. But I don't, whatever you do, carry the Bible. Because the man in the pulpit is fallible. And he can make mistakes even if he doesn't want to. But if you sit there with the word of God, you've got a chance to compare and to see that what he's saying is really, thus saith the word of God. Well, Jeremiah's explanation was simple. You, you've repeated the sins of your fathers and you just expect different results. That sound familiar? You know, our refusal to confess our sin and repent of it can suck the life and the vitality out of our lives and out of the life of the church. Verse 9, to me, is one of the saddest verses in Scripture. Maybe sometime I'll do the happiest verses and then, then the saddest. But verse 9 says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Do we take that for granted? That God's going to always bless regardless of what we do? We better be careful because the Lord can remove that joy. Well, the Lord uses several images, mental pictures to describe this captivity that would come upon them. Notice verse 13. In verse 13 it says, Therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that you know not. Jeremiah is using a, a words like cast you out. That's a strong word in Hebrews. It's like casting a spear with all of your might. It's like a strong wind or a hurricane hitting a boat all of a sudden. It's a sad verse. In other words, God was so violently removing his people from the land so that it could be healed. And the people could be purified. And Jeremiah was a country preacher, so he used fishing. Something they could understand. He used hunting. And he used banking. The Babylonians would cast their nets and they'd catch the Jews. And no fish would escape. If any of them tried to hide, the fishermen would become hunters. And the hunters would go across the land, capturing them. And they had borrowed, and their note was due. Verse 18 says, with a tremendous amount of interest. You know, we as a society have such a flippant attitude toward debt and our responsibility to it. I can't tell you how many times somebody's come to me and said, Brother Butch, would you pray with me? They came and picked up my car. Why would they do that? Could it be that you missed five payments? I mean, and now it's a bad bank. It's a bad credit union. Because they didn't live up to their responsibility. And this is, this is God talking here. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. I was talking earlier about Marion State Bank and 
how I love them. We're just all good friends. We've prayed together. We've done a lot of things. But when I sign a note there, it changes from good old Butch and good old so-and-so because now I'm a slave to the lender. We're not on equal terms. They decide. I can agree or disagree whether I'm going to pay the interest that much or I'm going to have this or that. But let me tell you something. When I sign on the line, I am now a slave to the lender. And it's a biblical admonition. So God is saying to the children of Israel, your note is due. And I'm coming and I will collect. Wow. Well, verse 14 and 15 talk about Jeremiah's consolation. In other words, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, and thank God it wasn't a train, you know. <laughs> and I look at Habakkuk's prayer in Habakkuk 3, 2. O Lord, I've heard thy speech, and I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known... In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. In Ephesians 4, we're told to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We're to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, to speak truth and to listen. And then this verse, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. That's one of the first things <coughs> the preacher told Joan and I when we got married. He knew how she was. He didn't know. But you know, I'm not going to tell you that we've lived by that all the time, but we've always known it to be true. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It'll keep. If you're not going to solve it that night, say Sunday, Saturday morning, we'll go get breakfast and we'll discuss it then. But don't let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So here we have another picture of God. Of the characteristics of God. Correcting. Oft times in wrath, but loving and merciful in its administration. Isn't that something? And at the time, whenever you've had a parent tell you, this is going to hurt me as much as it will hurt you, that gets a little shaky sometimes. But at the same token, with God, we, we're thankful that he knows how to correct us. Well, in the midst of all of this, he gives them a message of hope. Has God ever done that for you? If he hadn't, he will. You know, In the midst of all of that, he has a, a message of hope. God let them know that the exiles in ba would be in Babylon for 70 years, but a remnant would return. They'd return to the land. They'd rebuild the temple. They'd establish the nation. And you know, from what I've read... I don't think that after that, that they ever worship Gentile idols again. That's when we learn our lesson. Amen. Amen. You know, even a monkey learns by repetition, and I want to be smarter than a monkey anyway. I may not be Val Victorian if there's two monkeys in the class, but... But I want to be at least as smart as that monkey. I want to learn from our mistakes. And you know, in all honesty, I think we learn as much from the negative things in our life as we do the positive. 
You know, I, I've told you that I poured two gallons of scalding hot water on my foot, but I have never done it again. <laughs> I mean, the pain was worse than when I had children, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I know what you're thinking. Uh, but I have never forgot that pain. Never forgot that. And Joan says, do you still keep that picture in your billfold, on your phone? I said, yeah. I want to remind her. I, I don't want to do that again. And you all make a New Year's resolution and you don't keep it on January the 2nd. I make the one I don't want to pour that, and I've kept it every year since then. <laughs> we learn sometimes by the negative things that take place in our life. And that's why the scripture says in Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It does not say all things are good. I have people come up to me and say, this happened to that. How can that be good? It's not good. It says all things work together for good. To those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. You don't look for God's hand in the things that go. It's not going to bless your life. Well, yeah, come on. I'm out of gas. David, I think of our brother, David Walker, one time. He was in a Bible conference, and he was preaching, and I mean, he was slinging sweat. He was getting after it. And the guy sat down here on the front, and he said, Preach, brother, preach! And so he's going, and he was going again, and the guy on the front row says, Preach, brother, preach! And about the fourth time, David Walker stopped and he said, fella, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Wasn't going to get any better. Well, in the midst of all of this, he gave them the message of hope that a remnant would return, would rebuild the temple, would reestablish the nation. So finally, we see Jeremiah's affirmation in verses 19 through 21. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies and vanity and things wherein there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself? And they are no gods. Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might. And they shall know that my name is the Lord. You know, when a believer is faithful, certainly to the degree that Jeremiah was, God lets them see things that all are not blessed to see. Let me repeat that. When a believer is faithful, certainly to the degree that Jeremiah was, God lets him th see things that all are not blessed to see. You see, faith opens our eyes to things that the world can't understand, the world can't comprehend. And bless God, the world can't take away from you. And you and the Lord make a majority. He makes a majority all by himself, but it's, you got that extra vote there. In a burst of faith and prophetic joy, Jeremiah not only saw the Jewish remnant, but the Gentiles from all the nations of the world coming to worship the true and the living God. Isaiah had this same vision. Zechariah also. 
Gentiles will confess their sins of idolatry and admit that their idols were worthless. And then they'll be taught to know the Lord. And that's what the church is here for. To share the glorious gospel. To tell folks to abandon the world system and to come to Christ. And we try to make the message clear and plain. I know a pastor. He didn't grow up in Guadalupe County. But he asked his congregation to evaluate his message. We've been here 23 years, and I ain't never done that. And I ain't never going to do that. Because, see, if the message comes from God and comes from God's Word, it will evaluate us. And not us evaluate it. So, there's some things we get, need to realize. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Boy, how hopeless is that. But it also says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is not about having a religion. I had a religion for years. A lot of you have had a religion for a greater number of years. It's not about having a religion. It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That you come to the point and place and realize I can't save myself. And Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin and come into my heart and life and save me. And if you do, he will. For the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a wonderful thing when we come to the Christ and we come to him alone. And then, you know, how do I say this? If we have people here that have a baby, we all get plumb excited about it. Yeah. One, that it's not ours and we don't have to raise it. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we get excited about a newborn baby. And I come home and Joan says, uh, was it a boy or a girl? I don't know. Uh, what did they call the baby? How long was the baby? How much did it weigh? You know. But they had that baby and we're all excited and everything. But if somebody said they took that newborn baby and put it out by the dumpster out there and left it at night. Listen, I think they ought to be horse whipped and we tell God that they died of a heart attack. You know. But as a Christian church, that's what we do. We lead somebody to the Lord and we're real excited. They are born again. They are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then we say, okay, baby, grow up. And when the baby doesn't grow up or live up to our expectations, well, I don't know if they were saved in the first place. What have we done to feed that baby? First with the milk of the word, then with the meat of the word. And if they grow and mature, they will have spiritual children of their own. And so everyone here, all of us need to examine whether we've ever been born again. I was raised in church. And until I was full grown, I never heard the word born again. I never heard the word saved. 
I was asked, are you a Christian? I gave the name of my denomination and said, I've been baptized. I didn't want the young lady to think I was an aborigine. <laughs> she said, tell me about your baptism. Well, I can't. Why can't you? I was a baby. What did it mean to you? I guess it meant something to my mom and dad, but it didn't mean anything to me until I started searching the scriptures and I see that baptism came after salvation and not before it. They believed and they were baptized. Now they had a reason to be, you know. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're here saved and identified, but you don't have a church home. We want you to know that you're welcome here. That you are welcome here. But whatever that decision is, it's between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll stand down here at the front to receive you. Not because of who I am, but because of whose I am. I belong to him. And you belong to him if you're saved. But whatever that decision, make it for his honor and glory. Let's stand and pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and your power and your presence. And Lord, what you want to do in our heart and life, if we'll let you. And we don't doubt your word. We don't doubt your promise that the word will never return void or empty. But it will always accomplish that for which you sent it forth and prosper thereby. So the word's gone out this morning. And Lord, the Holy Spirit takes the word and he deals with each one of our heart. He's the one that does the convicting and says, sir, ma'am, you need to be saved. Sir, ma'am, you need to identify with Christ and plant your life in the life of his church. Whatever that decision, would you make it for his honor and his glory as we sing on that first verse, you come. Just as I am with.